Forward of The Calendar and Other Verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. To Robert Meeker. Dear boy, ten summers, ten swift summers now have come and gone since I last said good-bye. Ten idle, wasted summers gone, and how I hardly know, so swift the seasons fly. So swift the seasons come, so swift they go, that scare it seem one brief, one little day since boyish voices bid us come and play, and little girls did seem to lure us so. Oh, Robert! Robert! If in paradise these idle words of mine can penetrate, thou knowest, then, that tears have wet mine eyes. Thou knowest that I felt thy ruthless fate, and yet, dear boy, I sometimes feel that thou art happier there than I who mourn thee now. I.S.D. Written in 1912 Forward About a year ago, having collected all those poems and verses which I considered of any value, I took a certain pride in the thought that I might soon bring under one roof these imaginary children of mine, so that they might be sheltered in time of storm, as it were, from the cold and oft-times unfeeling world of commerce, but where friends of poetry, who had met with some of my stray children of verse in public journals, might meet with them again, if they desired, with other friendly faces around one common fireside but I found that the expense incident to such a venture was so great that unless a large number of copies were sold, I would be involved in a larger debt than I cared to contract. Then the plan of securing sufficient advance subscriptions to meet part of the expense of a first edition occurred to me, thereby following the method of Tennyson, Robert Burns, and others, of whose example I needed not to be ashamed. But other work prevented me, and still prevents me, from carrying out this plan. So lest those friends, who have shown an interest in my verses, should think that I have turned aside from the path of poetry, I herewith offer the calendar and other verses, as evidence of my love for and interest in the greatest of all the arts, hoping that the time may come when I shall be able to present a more worthy offering to the muses and perhaps justify the kind words that have recently appeared in regards to the author of The Quiet Life, a plain poem of the hills, which, in a revised form, appeared serially during the past summer in The Wayne Countian. I.S.D. Shehawken, Pennsylvania. End of Forward The Calendar and Other Verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. Section 1 The Calendar. Part 1 Come, walk a mile with me, tis January. The knee-deep snow lies heavy on the ground, And hark, the icy winds, how swift they hurry Over the fields with melancholy sound. And save these winds, or some forsaken raven, Winging its way along yon frozen hill, Nature is hushed her dormant image graven in marble masks on woodland, lake, and rill. 
and look. The trees their naked trunks are swaying, As bitterly each blast goes howling by. And hark, the music in the hemlocks playing, Like some lost spirit banished from the sky. And see the smoke from yonder chimney curling, Hugs the broad roofs, deep burdened with the snow while clouds of snow are round the low eaves whirling. How cold it is! Come, let us homeward go. There will we find the cheerful fire still burning. There ruddy warmth will make our faces glow, and there kind hearts will welcome our returning. Come, let us hasten through the drifty snow. Come walk a mile with me. Tis February. The sun is creeping slowly toward the north, And every breeze today seems blithe and merry, And prophets of the spring are waking forth. The hungry groundhog casts a thin, Gray shadow beside his open villa, Dark and cold, And the starved hare surveys the icy meadow, And chipmunks chatter in the leafless wald, and hark, the blue jay's fife is sounding shrilly, And merry chickadees are piping loud. E'en though the bitter north wind's breath is chilly, And the great trees are low before him bowed. And see, the lady of the south is creeping higher and higher. Tis the hour of noon, and sad-eyed winter by yon brook is weeping. Yon little brook that sings a pleasant tune. Yet, as the sun is with the day declining, Swift darkening clouds are gathering in the west, Where the snow fairies are again designing Another robe for nature's barren breast. Come walk a mile with me, Tis March and windy, and winter's dying breath comes hard and fast, And hark, the storm, like death bells of a Sunday, Tolls the sad knell upon the icy blast. Louder and louder now the winds are wailing, Faster and faster wings the frozen snow, Darker and darker the cold clouds are sailing, As the March storm goes hurrying to and fro. But see, the sun above the clouds is creeping, And look, soft flakes are falling, one by one, And winter, pale in death, lies gently sleeping, While spring awakes ere half the day is done. And soon the sun, like some great hearth, is burning, Melting the ghosts of winter on the hills, and hark, the robin from the south returning, Joins the glad music of the murmuring rills. And now the farmer boy, whose heart is leaping, Gathers the sap that sings a merry song, While the bluebirds sweet melodies are keeping, And noisy squirrels leap the trees among. Come walk a mile with me, Tis April weather, a voice like spring is calling, Let us go where violets are blooming on the heather, And songbirds bend the branches to and fro, For everywhere the ground is springing, And everywhere the grass is getting green. How can I now, how can I keep from singing When all the world is like a fairy scene? The buds and all the trees are ripe for bursting, and fleecy catkins flutter everywhere, And every little flower seems a-thirsting For something sweet and beautiful and fair. But look, to westward, see, An April shower sudden has gathered, Darkening the sun. Yet wait, beside me lifts a gentle flower That lights my pathway, blossoming alone. And hark, Oh, hark, the meadowlark is singing, 
greeting the storm from yon tall maple tree, while, like a herald in its homeward winging, wheels a lone flicker o'er the darkening lee. Come walk a mile with me, tis merry May time. The little lambs are gambling on the green. Nature is glad, it is the hour of playtime. And now, more never, her true heart is seen. The butterflies are floating down from heaven, And hummingbirds again are on the wing. And the kind swallows, seventy times seven, Fill all the air with merry murmuring. And see the lilacs by yon cottage blooming, How sweet the air is. Sweetness everywhere, for look, Rich apple blossoms are perfuming this little lane that leads to woodlands fair. Here honeysuckle bells are softly swinging, and pink azaleas perfume all the wood, and, in the trees, the vireos are singing incessantly their songs of solitude, while round the hill, as though our steps are wending, we hear a sweet voice calling, Come, O oh come, for see, the sun is in the west descending, and happy hearts are waiting us at home. Come walk a mile with me, tis June, fair June day, and nature smiles. Her magic hands are still, for not a ripple stirs yon lake at noonday, and not a breeze disturbs this woody hill. But hark! What idle dreamer is there drumming? It is, it is a pheasant calling, Come, and listen, Like a low voice sweetly humming Is heard the brook within its forest home. But wait, we cannot wait, T'will soon be summer, So let us now enjoy these days of June, For hear ye not that late but welcome comer Robert of Lincoln, caroling his tune. And see ye not yon oriole high swinging his basket from that tall and leafy tree? O comrade, comrade, time is swiftly winging. Twill not be always June with you and me. Springtime is passing, summer is a coming, and soon fair autumn with her idle dreams, and then cold winter her white hands benumbing the icy lakes and silent woodland streams. O oh, comrade, comrade, let us not be weary, but pick life's pretty blossoms while they bloom, forgetting every prospect, sad or dreary, avoiding every lane that leads to gloom. For see, each flower lifts a golden chalice inviting us to drink, Shall we pass by, with faces sad, Nor enter this fair place that June has reared us Neath the cloudless sky? Part Two Come, walk a mile with me. Tis July weather. The western sun is burning round and bright, And not a breeze disturbs yon tiny feather From a young swallow, Loosened in its flight. But hark! In yonder broad and sunlit meadow The sound of busy mowers fill the air, While from a tree that casts a pleasing shadow Is heard the locust piping shrilly there. And see! How strong men lift the scented grasses, And how they pile the wagons with the hay! How fast the rake, with rolling burden, passes, how regular the long, round windrows lay. And see, the sun, the great round sun is setting, Like a red rose upon the distant hill, Till all the earth seems tenderly forgetting Day's dying light on meadow, lake, and rill. But come, for darkness soon will gather round us, And we must pass through yonder woodlands there, and then white fields of buckwheat will surround us, and then, then, home we shall together share. 
Come, walk a mile with me. Tis August. Listen. The meadow quail is whistling merrily. And see, the dew drops, like great diamonds, glisten on grass and shrub and bush and bending tree. And everywhere is peace and joy and plenty. For everywhere this morning we may go, one seed of spring has well returned its twenty, till autumn's face with goodness is aglow. Yes, oaten fields are white and ripe for reaping, and green things paling in the garden there tell us too well that summer is a-sleeping, and harvest time is on us unaware. The early apples even now are falling, the tasseled corn, the fields of ripening rye, the purpling grape, all, all are sadly calling that summer's glory, too, must fade and die. But hark, what sound is that? It seems like thunder, and yet tis but the wind within the trees, the far-off wind, fresh filled with nameless wonder, a prophecy of autumn's freshening breeze. Come, walk a mile with me. Tis sweet September, And quietly the clouds are gliding by, And silent runs the brook that, you remember, We passed last spring. It now is dumb and dry. And overhead the first red leaf is falling, And underfoot the flowers are fading fast, While in the air I hear a strange, sad calling, that tells me summer is forever past. And yet how peaceful seems the face of heaven, how calm the earth is, nature is at rest, and all the hopes that unto spring were given folds autumn now in silence to her breast. The birds are singing, yet not half so sweetly as when they sung their song at opening spring, and flowers are blooming, yet not so completely as when the birds were first upon the wing. And I am singing, but the fading glory of autumn time subdues my idle song. For what is autumn but the sweet, sad story of leaves that fade, and lives that last not long? Come, walk a mile with me. Tis now October, and yet the fields put forth fresh blades of green, lest the advancing days shall seem to sober and prophesy too plainly the unseen. For nature loves to lead us forth blindly, giving a glory to the fading leaf. Yet were it worse if, speaking less unkindly, nature should plainly tell us life is brief. The flowers, too, are fading, and are dying. The leaves are falling, and incessantly, and on the hills great flocks of crows are crying, and the blue jays once more are calling me. But winter, winter soon, too soon, is coming. For see, see there, the frost is on the grass, and the wild bee, I hear no more its humming as once I did, whenever I might pass. And Robin, he is gone, and all the singing of all the sweet birds now no more I hear, while the dry leaves, to barren branches clinging, full plainly speak the passing of the year. Come, walk a mile with me. November, faintly the long, blue hills lift to the eastern sky. Tis Indian summer now, this day seems saintly, like some good martyr ere he goes to die. The skies are cloudless, not a breeze is blowing, and silent is each bare and leafless form. The brooks, how quiet! I like not their flowing, for, oh, it is the calm before the storm. 
yes, yes, e'en now, to westward, look, a figure is sudden forming, stretching forth a wand, shaping a shape as of some giant, bigger than any fabled thing from fairyland. Higher and higher that strange shape is lifting, swifter and swifter its fleet heralds run, wider and wider its white breath is drifting as lower sinks the slow descending sun. And now, the storm, the storm is on us. Hurry, yet see, the myriad snowflakes, see them come, O comrade, see, it is young winter's flurry, and yet tis but the storm that drives us home. Come walk a mile with me, tis dark December, the cold, rough winds are never, never still. Oh, for the days of spring I well remember, oh, for the flowers that blossomed on the hill, and wish you not that you, you too were playing upon the hillside, building castles there, dreaming sweet dreams, as when we went a-maying, midst singing birds and blossoms sweet and fair. But hark, the wind, and see, the falling snowflakes, how thick they come, how beautiful they seem. Yet I am weary, weary of the snowflakes. O oh, comrade, tell me, is it all a dream? O oh, comrade, comrade, the winter is upon us. Our hopes, like snowflakes, now are falling fast. Our dreams are broken. God have mercy on us. We must not perish in the wintry blast. For see, oh see, the sun, the sun is shining. Tis noon, and lo, yon glorious orb of day is turning backward, a new year designing. So shall all winters turn to spring all way. And so shall winter be an emblem only of the dark days that meet us, one and all, making our little lives seem sad and lonely, until the new year answers to our call, until another spring renewing nature, renews our hopes that were so desolate, giving us faith that not one living creature is blindly born to blindly meet its fate. End of section one. Section two of the calendar and other verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield from Traditions in Biloxi, Mississippi. The calendar and other verses by Irving Sidney Dix. Section 2. Niagara. Almighty organ of America, ere mortal man thy voice did hear, thy notes full clear, rose with voluptuous music on the air, till angels wondering hesitated there, and rude barbarians fell in fear beside thy godlike amphitheater. Thus, when thy ancient spirit touched those keys, those smooth polished keys, those swift and mighty keys, a powerful yet a pleasing note was found, that gave to silence round a song whereof no mortal heard a sound, but which did heaven please through the long centuries and unto these. Then, when the red man's blue-eyed brother came, Beside this shrine, thy temple here to claim, Humbled was he, such glory here to see, Thy awful music's note upon his spirit's smote, Subduing stronger passions of the mind, 
until, like prisoners suffering there confined, those gentler melodies. Within his bosom there, ascended with thy voice to heaven in one triumphant prayer. Then louder, ye organ of America, still louder sound thy anthems on the sky, and thou, Niagara, ere thy spirit die, wake, wake the courts of heaven with thy lay, till the dear angels learn like thee to pray for all the world today. Yet louder, ye organ of America, still louder let thy spirit from those keys, those smoothly polished keys, those swift and heavy keys, strike with inspiring fingers heaven and earth's triumphant harmonies. End of section two. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield from Traditions in Biloxi, Mississippi. Calendar and other verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wooly B. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. Fairies of the Frost. When the frost spirit, with her icy wand, strikes the cold north wind, bringing frost and snow, she sends her fairies through the frozen land to deck with sculpture all the world below. Soon every bank, so lately green with grass, like streets of marble to the margin lies, and here and there, wherever one may pass, frail fairy structures magic-like arise. The slender willows, bowed in artless grief, appear in white as pledge of winter's care, and every idle reed and clinging leaf hath spirits, full as bright, beside them there, while pine and hemlock, shorn of all their green, stand out like sculptured druids of the wood and the small beeches hovering between seem children of some banished brotherhood. The broken stumps become as kingly chairs, the fallen logs great pillars round and white, and the dead branches oriental stairs that lead to rooms all glittering with light. Each mossy knoll becomes a marble mound, the unlettered stones all artless works of art and e'en the brooklets in the forest round are set with diamonds near to nature's heart. End of section 3 Fairies of the Frost Recording by Wooly B. Section 4 of The Calendar and Other Verses This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix The Rivermen When, in the days gone by, down the Delaware, the high spring floods, with an angry roar, were running like breakers far up the shore, then the riverman, by his chimney seat, would feel his stout heart strangely beat. So it was ho, for the raft and the river again, the raft and the river for river men. When the creeks flowed wild round the Delaware, and the sky showed blue through the sharp spring air, and the rafts were waiting the raftmen there, then these river men were ill content until their backs to the oars were bent. So it was ho for the raft and the river again, the raft and the river for river men. When in days gone by down the Delaware, those great rafts tethered against the shore were loosed like chafing steeds once more. Then out of the valleys and off the hills the raftmen came flocking with schoolboy wills, and twas ho for the raft and the river again, the raft and the river for river men. End of section four The River Men Recording by Anusha Ayer Mumbai Five of the calendar and other verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix The School of Life Life is a school, and all that tread the earth are pupils in it. Its lessons all should learn, and few there be who escape them, and they are fools. At birth this school begins, at death it ends, and many terms there be, and faithful teachers not a few. Necessity is one, for even the babe when it first feels the cool and earthly air, and sees the light of day, shrinks from their touch, and cries aloud, herewith it doth begin to learn the alphabet of life. Then hunger comes, and so to ease itself the babe doth learn to love the things that give it life. Thus hour by hour and day by day it gathers knowledge at the school, but knows it not, even as wiser men of knowledge full know scarcely what they do. And months pass by, the babe becomes a child, eager to learn, to imitate, to know, lisping the lessons of a higher grade, repeating words of wisdom, gems of truth, that others think the little thing should know, until at length in childish innocence it leaves the kindergarten of the world, and knocks upon the door of adult life and enters there, flushed with the lulling sense of something new. The playthings are forgot, the little bells no longer please the ear, the little books no longer feed the mind, the little seats no longer suit the child, the little friends no longer stir the soul, for it hath learned the alphabet of life, and put aside the primer once for all. There is a longing now for deeper life, that fills the heart to overflow. There is a tumult now within the swollen veins, when, for the first, they feel a larger life in union close beating to its own. There is a hatred of authority and of restraint, a satisfaction now, as of a soul enamoured with itself, a soul insolvent on the rising tide of pure existence, with such a stubbornness as mocks advice and takes a happy pace securer of its own security. And like the waters of a swollen stream that leaves its early channels far behind, youth ventures into unknown paths, full fed by surging hopes, by sudden deep desires, by wild ambitions and a thousand things unnamed and nameless, rivulets of life that empty in this stirring stream. Now would the student leave his school and play among the hills or in the valley's shade. Now would the scholar chafe at books and knowledge and authority. Rough banks that, like a dyke, hold in life's mighty stream until the floods of springtime can abate, and in a clearer, safer channel course again. So, with life's lessons still unlearned, full many a scholar even would graduate with highest honours, and in his pride and surety of knowledge be a god to give advice to those who should advise. Forth full of wisdom would he quickly go, and even issue take with all the world, but when this truant fever runs its course, this heyday of existence has its turn, back to the school the skulking scholar comes, like a whipped cur, and willing to be taught by those same teachers he so lately spurned, and left for larger things. For manhood now is here, the errors and the follies every one by the wise student surely now are seen, and in the book of life he reads with ready eye the rules and lessons, and considers well his bold instructors, want, adversity, and disappointment with her heavy hand the whip of scorn and sorrow's bitter book, and sickness's long and tedious term, and all the various teachers of the school. And if perchance these lessons be forgot, these his instructors will rehearse him well, lest he forget in later life these things, and be a dullard in the school of schools, a freshman wise in his own foolishness. So manhood comes, and so it surely goes, from grade to grade and term to term, with all the questions and perplexing rules, and devious methods of the mastermind, who holds the key to all the questionings, yet leaves the student to himself alone, half puzzled by the figures on the dial that tell the hour when he shall graduate above earth's petty problems, and shall hold a clearance to that life which is to come, and whereunto he graduates, perchance a better man. A better man, if not, so shall he go again in that same grade where a laggard half asleep in school, he wakes to find himself a scholar still, with all the vexing problems yet unsolved, which in his idleness and lust of life were left until the morrow, and the sun to usher in another dreamless day. So manhood comes, and so it surely goes, till those who here have studied to become proficient in the lessons of life shall be excused from school and left to play by running brooks and hills that shout for joy, and living waters wild in their delight. So is it meet that all should labour now to learn these lessons well, so, when the day of graduation comes, a voice will say, Well done, perfect in life, perfect in death, receive thy rich reward, for thou hast found perfection is the only key to heaven. End of section 5, The School of Life
of the calendar and other verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield from Traditions in Biloxi, Mississippi. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. Section 6 A Visit from the Cricket. Thou shrill voiced cricket there in yonder corner, thou remindest me of joys departed and of fair and fallen summer. O little mourner, cease thy pensive fluting lest a flood of melancholy, sad as thine, that to my heart is suiting, encompass me. It is unholy thus to pine, for the fallen joys or days departed, e'en though thou art so broken-hearted, for moments are divine. Silent art thou, thanks to thee, O little cricket, underneath my chair, thanks to thee, Yet I would see thy shadow less, Out to yon thicket. There let thy dull repining Drive where the winds are driven, Not deign to bring thy sorrows back. Let such be given to those In shades reclining, Who love to sing, With thee of dear departed summer, And hear again of her sad funereal drummer thou little mournful thing. One moment stay, why comest thou with doleful ditty, unbidden to my room? We dusky mourner do not go, but say, what is it claims thy pity, and sets thee telling, telling such a solemn story so to me, as if their knelling, knelling of some departed glory dear to thee? O oh, sad musician, put aside thy fiddle, and admit life is a riddle, and heaven holds the key. Thou mindest not, for hark, again resounds thy racket. Shriller than before, singest thou this sad strain as if befitting to thine ebon jacket, with carvings curious and a color glossy, like old wine. Tiny thing, be not so furious and unneedful noisy. Cease to pine, for something fled, for joys or hopes departed, or thou wilt make the angels broken-hearted, O mourner most divine. End of section 6 Recording by Jeannie Whitfield From Traditions in Biloxi, Mississippi of The Calendar and Other Verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shakira Searle. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. 7. In Praise of Inez. Sweet Inez, would that I might pledge my thoughts to thee with line on line, And prove, if tender words can prove, That all my tender thoughts are thine. Would that my feeble pen might pluck from the green fields of poetry Some flower, sweet girl, wherewith to deck thy name so near, so dear to me. Would that my hand might gather here, from the sweet fields of tender thought, Some blossom, fragrant as the rose, some lily, lovely as I ought. But why should I commit a sin by wishing any flower for thee? Thou art more beautiful, I know, than all the flowers of poetry. What shall I then with thee compare to make a true comparison? The dawning day? The dying light? The rising or the setting sun? At morn I see the early sun appear with glory in her eye. But looking there I think of thee, and thinking of thee, for thee sigh. At noon I see that fervid orb proclaim the sultry hour of day. But looking there, I think of thee, and thinking of thee, turn away. At length I see that same bright sun descend below the western blue. 
Yet looking there, I think of thee, And thinking of thee, love thee, too. Fade, then, ye flowers of the field, And sink, ye dying beams of light, But let, oh, let my inners be Forever present to my sight. End of seven. In praise of Innes. Recording by Shakira Searle. Number eight of the calendar and other verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Whitfield from Traditions in Biloxi, Mississippi. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix The Crime of Christmas Time Two thousand years, two thousand years since Mary, with a mother's fears, brought forth for all humanities the Christian of the centuries, and now men turn from toil away to celebrate his natal day, by feasting happy hours away, and giving gifts with lavish hand throughout the length of every land. A noble custom, nobly born, In Bethlehem one holy morn, But intermingling with the good, A pagan custom long has stood, As you and I and all may see, This war against the greenwood tree, This robbing of posterity, Until the burden of my rhyme Is of this crime of Christmas time. The skies are white with soft moonlight, in Christian lands the lamps burn bright, In splendor gleaming from the walls Of parlors and of festive halls, Or yet amid some snow-white choir, Sweet maidens sing the world's desire, Till, answering in low refrain, The people all repeat the strain Of peace on earth to men good will, When sudden all the hall is still. Then tender music, soft and low, heavenward seems to float and flow. But mid these glittering lights, O oh, see the stately form of greenwood tree, whose graceful arms are drooping wide, as grieving this fair Christmas tide. The hills are white with lovely light, and everywhere the stars burn bright in splendor gleaming on the wood where once in loyal familyhood the evergreens together stood. But now no vespers sweet or low in happy measures upward flow. For there by heaven's lights, O oh, see the absence of the greenwood tree, whose noble form once waving wide this melancholy waste did hide. Yet here and there a lonely tree still sounds a mournful melody, and answering in low refrain, the winds repeat the solemn strain, until the hills, conscious of harm, awaken in a wild alarm, until with trumpets to the sky they echo up to heaven the cry, Ye forest, rouse, shake off thy shroud, and sound a protest, long and loud. Ye mountains, speak, and heaven tried this carelessness of Christmas tide, and man, thou prodigal of time, bestir thyself, and heed my rhyme, and curve this crime of Christmas time. End of section eight. Recording by Jeanie Whitfield from Traditions in Biloxi, Mississippi. Section 9 of The Calendar and Other Verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. The Minor. Beyond the beams of brightening day, a lonely miner, moving slow along a darkly winding way, is daily seen to go where shines no sun or cheerful ray to make those gloomy caverns gay for there no glorious morning light is burning in a cloudless sky and there no banners flaming bright are lifted heaven high but that lone miner far from sight 
treads boundless realms of boundless night. There neither brook nor lovely lawn allures the miner's weary eye, for having caught one glimpse of dawn with many an anxious sigh, those precious lights are left in pawn to be by fainter hearts withdrawn. Nor tender leaf nor fragrant flower dare penetrate that fearful gloom where low beneath a crumbling tower or dark resounding room yon miner in some evil hour a ruined prisoner may cower yet while the day is speeding on far from those skies that shine so clear far from the glory of the sun and happy birds that cheer hark through those echoing caves anon the hammer's merry monotone there far from every happy sound of blithesome bird or cheerful song in yonder solitudes profound the miner all day long hears his own music echo round those deep-voiced caverns underground there in that gloom which doth affright faint-hearted sky enamoured men the miner with his little light hews out a hollow den and seems to find some keen delight where others see but noisome night thus many a heart along life's way must labour where no cheerful sun of golden hopes or pleasures gay shines till the day is done for where the deepest shadows play the purest hearts are led astray yet some unseen by careless fate know not of gloom or sorrow here but happily with hearts elate they walk a charmed sphere and lightly laugh or lightly prate of lonely souls left desolate so are we miners great and small by sunny slope or lower gloom and day by day we hear a call as from the distant tomb but when the evening shadows fall the lights of home will gleam for all end of section nine the minor recording by anusha ayer mumbai of the calendar and other verses this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the calendar and other verses by irving sydney dix love of country love of country is the life of war love not your country then if loving it should lead you into war Oh, do not be deceived. Love is broader. Love is broader than a wheat field. Love is broader than a landscape. Do not be misled. Love the world. Begin at home. Love your birthplace. Then your county. Then your state. Then your country. Then the countries of your brothers and sisters who look so much like you. Like hands, like feet like ears like eyes like lips like sorrows like hopes like joys like body mind and spirit for the spirit of one man differeth not from the spirit of another or high or low or rich or poor being the same yesterday today and forever love of country is the life of war love not your country then if loving it should lead you into war should lead you into hatred of your neighbor's country lead you to strike down even unto death your brother who so resembles you made in your image and in the likeness of the living god end of section 10 love of country recording by anusha ayer mumbai Eleven of the calendar and other verses this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix The Sinking of the Titanic Titanic, rightly named, sir, says the captain of the ship, and the safest of all vessels, now mark her maiden trip. And all think as the captain thinks, all her two thousand souls, as steadily out over the sea the stately vessel rolls. For she is shod with iron, and her frame is built of oak, and stout hearts man the vessel, wherefore the captain spoke. And with naught for pleasure lacking, so stately and so fair, she seems a floating palace, fit for angels living there. So farewell, says Merry England, farewell, says each green isle, and blessings for this noble ship on her initial trial, and praise be to her makers, and goodwill to her crew, and safety to her passengers, take this as our adieu. Oh, there were pleasant partings as the vessel sailed away, and there was joy in every heart that pleasant April day, and there were happy thoughts of home, of meeting kith and kin, for the stately vessel soon would be her harbour safe within. And so blew the sky above them, and so blew the wave beneath, that all, all thought of living, and no one thought of death, as hour by hour the vessel left England far behind, and hour by hour the ship sped on as speeds an ocean wind. And when night came, with fond good nights the floating city slept, yet ever over them rolling waves the mighty vessel swept, and no one thought of danger, until with thunderous roar the great ship struck the rock like ice, and shook from floor to floor. Then there was breaking timbers, and bulging plates of steel, and noise of great commotion along that vessel's keel. Then there were cries of anguish, and curses from rough men, and earnest prayers for safety, O oh, prayers for safety then. For women wept in terror, and stout men dropped a tear, and the shouting and the tumult was maddening to hear. Yet there amidst that seething the lifeboats, one by one, were set adrift at midnight, where cold sea rivers run. Then on that fated vessel the thousand waited there, in hope some sea-born sister would snatch them from despair. But no ship came to aid her, and in the dead of night the noble ship Titanic sank suddenly from sight. O oh, midway in old ocean, in her darkest, deepest gloom, a thousand brave hearts bravely went down to meet their doom. And what a tragic picture, oh what a solemn sight, upon that fated vessel with the stars still shining bright. Then there was time for thinking, oh time enough to spare, and there was time for cursing and time enough for prayer. Time, time for retrospection and time enough to die. Time, time for life's greatest tragedy, and time to reason why. That was the greatest battle that ever yet was fought, that was the greatest picture on any canvas wrought, that was the greatest lesson that mortal man can teach, that was the greatest sermon that priests of earth can preach. Yet no one fought that battle with sabre or with gun, and no one saw that picture save those brave hearts alone. And no one read that lesson there written in the dark, and no one heard that sermon that went straight to its mark. Nor shall we know their story, the saddest of the sea. Or shall we learn the sequel, the sorrow yet to be? But long shall we remember how brave men bravely died, For some poor lowly woman with a baby at her side. And when the world gets scorning the greatest of the great, When poverty sits cursing the man of large estate, Oh, then let men remember how in that awful hour The wealth of all the world was powerless in its power. End of section 11. The Sinking of the Titanic. of the calendar and other verses this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by shakira Searle. the calendar and other verses by irving sydney dix 12 war and peace war is hell war is hell this is what the war men yell, yet they love to be in hell, love to hear the iron hail strike till even strong men quail, love the dying soldiers knell, ringing shot and shrieking shell, love to hear the battle cry, love to see men fight and die with the struggle in their eye. War is hell, war is hell, this is what the war men yell. War is wrong, war is wrong. This the burden of my song. War is wrong, war is wrong. 
Sound the paean human tongue. Let the message far be flung. Sound it, sound it heaven high, sound it to the starry sky, and heaven repeat the echoing till all the earth of peace shall sing. Peace loves day, but war loves night. Peace loves calmness, war to fight, in the wrong or in the right. Peace the hungry man gives bread, war would give a stone instead. Peace is honest, not so war, crying any way is fair. Peace loves life, war loves the dead, with a halo overhead. Peace pleads justice, war cries might, in the wrong or in the right. Peace pleads, love your fellow man, war cries kill him if you can. Peace no evil thing would slight, yet while daring, dares not fight, knowing might makes nothing right. Peace means liberty and life, war means enmity and strife. Peace means plenty, peace means power, war means hell, and would devour all who do not trust its power. Peace means joy and love tomorrow. War means hatred, death, and sorrow. Peace says, bless you, men are brothers. War says, damn you and all others. War is hell, war is hell. This is what the war men yell. War is wrong, war is wrong. This the burden of my song. War is wrong, war is wrong. There never was a just one, never. There never was a just one, never. True as two from two leaves none, true as days are never done, true as rivers downward run, true as heaven holds the sun. War is wrong, war is wrong. There never was a just one, never. There never was a just one, never. Sound the message, human tongue. Sound it, sound it heaven high, sound it to the starry sky, and heaven repeat the echoing till all the earth of peace shall sing. End of 12. War and Peace. Recording by Shakira Searle. Thirteen of The Calendar and Other Verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shakira Searle. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. 13. Peace and War. Blessed is that man who first cries peace, but cursed is he who first cries war. For war is murder, it must cease, forever and from everywhere. End of 13. Peace and War. Recording by Shakira Searle. of The Calendar and Other Verses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shakira Searle. The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. 14. To Andrew Carnegie. Philanthropist, fast-sighted millionaire, Lover of prose and friend of poetry, What needs my pen in furtherance declare? Thou art also a friend of liberty. Thou art, indeed, a very prince of peace, Who, conscious of the uselessness of war, Believest man's red carnage soon should cease, And nations now for nobler things prepare. What needs my pen in furtherance recite Thy kindly interest in the weal of man? Yet, lacking need, I nothing lose to write, but rather gain in praising as I can. For if thy wealth the world sweet peace may give, perhaps my lines in praise of peace may live. End of 14. To Andrew Carnegie. Recording by Shakira Searle. End of The Calendar and Other Verses by Irving Sidney Dix. 